Hello and welcome to my TED talk. Do we need an EU space law? And if so, what could it be about? Um, in fact, the topic is maybe a bit strange because we have already an EU space law. There is a whole body of regulations, uh, decisions um, by the Council, by the Commission. Just recently, the EU space program regulation was adopted and it now governs uh, uh, the EU space uh, program implementation for the upcoming years. Um, we had before GNSS regulation, Copernicus regulation, implementing regulations by the Commission, for example, on the Copernicus data policy. So in short, we already have quite a developed body of legislation on European level concerning space. Uh, concerning space. However, this um, is not what I'm really talking about. It's uh, Ah, naja, jetzt bin ich irgendwie, jetzt bin ich irgendwie raus. Jetzt müssen wir noch. Hello and welcome to my TED Talk on uh, Do we need an EU space law? And if so, how could it look like? Um, this question, idea may sound a little bit strange because we already have an EU space law. Just recently, the EU space program regulation was finally adopted um, and uh, it governs now the uh, implementation of the EU space programs for the upcoming years. There is a whole body uh, already since, since many years of, of uh, other uh, implementing regulations by the European Commission, um, decisions by the Council, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is, a, there is already a, a legislative body on space within the European Union. So but why are we talking about this today? In fact, when I talk about EU space law, it's not meaning, let's say, the implementing legislation for the EU space policy. It's really going into the more narrow uh, field of space law, which of course has a lot to do with the international space treaties, the outer space treaty, the registration convention, the liability convention, and so forth. Why? Is this a question? In fact, many member states uh, have recently adopted national space legislation or have undertaken reform of uh, existing national space legislation. If, if we look to that, uh, 20 years ago, there was only a handful of member states uh, which, which had such, such a national space law. Then we saw a first wave uh, of legislation around 2010 or so, when uh, the small satellite phenomenon really took shape. And in many member states, university or spin-off companies of universities, they had the first national uh, CubeSat, NanoSat project, and some states said, okay, we need uh, a national law uh, concerning uh, these uh, programs and, and uh, to manage uh, certain, certain obligations under the EU space treaties in such a national law. Okay, that was one phenomenon. However, now yeah, we are in the middle of the new space phenomenon. And uh, there are many, many new startup companies around Europe, just in Germany alone. Uh, a recent study has uh, brought up uh, something like 120 new space companies. In other member states, uh, it's a similar development. And according to some estimations, we see uh, 800 to up to 1,000 new space uh, companies, and including a lot of startups around, uh, around Europe. And these uh, startups, they undertake, uh, many of them are more in software component, 
um, um, uh, manufacturing, etc. But uh, there is also an increasing number targeting really space activities like operation of whole constellation of satellites, um, development of new launchers and uh, provision of launching services with these new launchers, or even uh, some companies uh, targeting um, more, let's say, futuristic activities like uh, space resource exploitation, activities on the moon, etc., etc. So uh, many countries, uh, they have reacted to this by reforming or adopting new legislation. And uh, what we see here since uh, recently is that this leads to a kind of, let's say, regulatory competition among the member states who is offering the most favorable framework to all these new startup companies, which country can attract most of them, yeah? which country uh, can uh, attract, let's say, the most promising activities and thereby create uh, the, the highest number of jobs and can increase uh, their international competitiveness. And uh, in fact, this is not only uh, uh, space law, other things like tax law, company law, uh, good skilled uh, people, um, infrastructure elements, all this also plays a role when companies decide on their, on their location. But one key aspect is really the national space law. For those of you who are not so familiar, um, the um, international space treaties, they set certain obligations on um, the uh, states parties to these treaties. Um, the most relevant are that the states are first of all responsible for all the space activities undertaken, including also activities by private actors. They are obliged to ensure authorization and continuous supervision of commercial space activities. They have to ensure reg uh, registration of space objects, both in a national register and then also notification to the uh, UN space object register. And last but not least, maybe even most important, the uh, states are also liable for any damage uh, caused in space, in airspace, or on ground, caused by any uh, of their commercial actors. So in case a company uh, undertakes certain space activities and li this leads to a damage of another country or of another person in another country, <clears throat> then the state can be held liable. And uh, um, uh, this is, of course, then going down to the taxpayer. So all these elements, they lead uh, to the um, to an increasing number of national space legislation. And this is not only a European phenomenon. We also see uh, this wave of, of new legislation around uh, the globe, New Zealand, um, Australia, um, uh, countries in South America, and so on and so on. Um, in Europe, um, there are currently several member states working on uh, space legislation or amendments. This includes, for example, Germany, where I come from, but uh, also Poland, Czech Republic, um, Switzerland. They are all considering it. Norway is in the final process of amending uh, their law. It's, uh, the UK has recently, well, it's already some uh, two and a half years ago, has recently adopted one, but it's now entering into force and so forth and so forth. Um, now, if we go back to the EU and we see that, let's say, uh, proper regulation of the internal market and uh, uh, is, is one of the key uh, targets of the European Union. And, and if we see uh, this increasing uh, regulatory competition among the member states in the field of national space law, then, uh, of course, the idea of a harmonizing law on European level, um, what? Well, yeah, um, comes comes into the uh, discussion. Now, um, there is there is a, a certain problem uh, here. Uh, 
And uh, this is caused by um, Article 189 of the so-called Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, the TFEU. Um, this article, uh, in fact, um, gives the EU the competence to uh, adopt a space policy and also to undertake uh, uh, space programs, uh, space research, etc., etc. But it also includes an explicit uh, uh, sentence, which, which is or half a sentence, which says excluding any harmonization of the laws of the member states. So, in fact, uh, European space law harmonizing the national space laws of all the member states is prohibited by this article. Now, there is a certain politico-academic uh, discussion uh, whether if uh, this uh, prohibition under Article 189, okay, yes, but um, it can be justified under other articles may, and specifically those concerning the internal market. Um, for me personally, I think it's it's a bit strange yeah, uh, when the treaty was adopted. Yeah, of course, there was a political will behind it. And if we have such an explicit uh, exclusion of any harmonizing law in one article, it's a bit um, strange to say, ah, yeah, but then we take just another article and we do it. Okay, but this is an ongoing discussion. We don't enter into into the details now. But, but even if um, we would ignore this article, we say, yes, it, uh, it's possible, then it's also uh, not so obvious yeah? because uh, under the UN space treaties, the states are responsible and they are liable and they have to register uh, space objects. And of course, uh, they are, uh, as in other areas of uh, UN law, they are quite keen to keep uh, their sovereignty in this regard and uh, also to take uh, key decisions uh, how they uh, implement their international uh, obligations. And, and even if you go a step further, um, we, we have seen uh, when the telecom sector was privatized, uh, something like 20, uh, more than 20 years ago, um, also uh, the EU set uh, 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 rules for the national uh, licensing processes and also for assignments of frequencies, etc., etc. And uh, when looking to this uh, older uh, legislation, one could certainly also identify certain elements which are basically uh, similar to, to laws uh, on the licensing of commercial space activities. On the other hand, yeah, if uh, a state is liable on the international level, well, why should now a European law impose a certain cap, yeah, a maximum cap or a minimum cap? It's also um, a bit uh, difficult to see. Um, but in any case, there, there are certain elements where um, European harmonization, not necessarily meaning by law, uh, but a certain coordination among the member states uh, is really useful, if not even pressing. And this concerns uh, mainly those elements which uh, are related to the um, protection of the space environment and ensuring also long-term space uh, sustainability. What we are concretely talking about is the avoidance of space debris, um, the active removal of space debris, uh, measures uh, to avoid uh, collisions in space, up to leading to a, a complex uh, a whole set of space traffic management Rules. And there is currently an ongoing uh, um, uh, discussion on European level for a space traffic management um, uh, system um, with very ambitious plans. And in the frame of these, uh, it might also be that certain common, common uh, standards are adopted. And uh, in order to make these uh, standards also binding for commercial operators, of course, uh, there need to be uh, some 
um, some legislation in, in this context. So, so what could be a, a very useful and important element uh, would be, let's say, a common set of standards on commercial operators uh, harmonized through the EU, what the companies have to do in order to comply um, with the standards. Uh, at a minimum, yeah, this could uh, uh, make the international non-binding guidelines, uh, such as the IADC guidelines for space debris, uh, binding. Uh, and this is already done by several of the member states. But on the other hand, we also see that uh, the, the international non-binding guidelines, um, they, they are probably insufficient. Uh, they were adopted, developed at a time when um, we haven't seen these massive constellations, uh, so-called mega constellations, uh, uh, Elon Musk, Starling above all, but also many others. And uh, the, the dangers uh, and developments have certainly been underestimated. So Europe could even lead here and move forward and set uh, certain higher standards than those currently adopted on um, international level. Um, so what uh, could be really reflected is that the member states uh, form a kind of working group where they exchange on national space law, um, how they do it, definitions, um, space object registry, also handling certain cases, uh, which country among them uh, takes responsibility uh, for registration, for licensing, etc. And uh, these uh, development of common standards. Thanks a lot for listening and a good afternoon.